नमस्ते सब जाना भाई आज सब भाई मार्टिन चौतारी आम टू थैंक फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी आज स्पेशली तारा गाँव म्युजिम को बारे में म फोकस में बसर क्या तर ती भाग अगड़ी मैक्टली ब्रिफ आप bio or what i'm doing in grammar i want to uh, highlight uh, that's in me. it's very brief i was i studied uh, fine arts in nepal japan and uk and uk i i became a graphic designer and then i was artist and interior designer and so on and uh, when i returned back to nepal in 2013 uh, that's how i got connected with the taragon museum so now i i'm a director there people call me curator but it has got i think i will not call myself a curator just yet but uh, <laughs> uh, Nepal is really fine to me yeah yeah okay. really. that's that's fine um these are these are some of the organizations i'm i'm involved with currently um the first one is the the Taragao museum um that is actually under the Saraf foundation and sara foundation actually runs the taragao museum nepal architecture archive and the sagarmatha next uh, the sagarmatha next is actually also runs under the himalayan museum and sustainable park as well and there is another museum i am trying to kind of uh, establish which is my father's museum uh, it's it's going to be called the national museum or i don't know what it's going to be called but i'm working on that idea at the moment and the other one i created is a global nepali museum so basically that's a, a collection database of nepali objects that's scattered around the world um mainly i will i'll try to focus myself within the taragao museum and then uh, i will talk about there are four museums i'm currently kind of working with at the moment and they all are in a different um, level now taragao museum is already established uh sagarmatha next that's a that's a art center we are opening in khumbu namche and uh, that is basically we, it's under construction uh, the building is going to be there but we don't have any objects or contents or anything uh mr museum i've got all the contents but i haven't got the museum and uh, global nepali museum i i don't own any content but it's there it's basically a collection of artwork from all around the world based on nepali objects so it has got sculptures uh powas thangkas contemporary artwork and everything um i'm connected with uh, the kathmandu university as well there i uh, teach uh, archive documentation and research uh, uh, so it's just a once a week i'm taking the classes there and the last logo is a nepal heritage documentation project this is a project uh, we are doing under the saraf foundation Uh, and we are working with the Heidelberg University in Germany and basically we are collecting a uh, creating an inventory uh, based on Nepali cultural and heritage sites so that's what it is but i'll try my best to kind of focus mainly on on the Taragao museum so just before i start with the taragao museum i just want to introduce myself as an artist as well this is some of the images uh, just some of the paintings uh, we exhibited in 2018 with uh, one of my colleague uh, kapil munir dikshit so these are just some of the shots and basically it was based on a nude male uh, so you can see some of these images and uh, this one as well it's on the same uh, theme So Taragao Museum I don't know how many of you have actually been to Taragao Museum and how many actually you actually know about the museum itself um just want to give you a brief kind of overview of the museum how it actually all started uh the building itself is almost to be very precise I think 45 years old and it was it was designed by an Austrian architect in the in the 70s and his name is Karl Pusha he's in his mid 80s at the moment and the last time he came to Nepal was i think 2012 when he was here 
And initially, these buildings were built to promote tourism at that time in the 70s. And the 70s was more like a hippie era. And then all these foreign scholars, people, travelers, you know, they used to come to Nepal. And they all kind of ended up contributing to our uh, heritage, tradition, and culture. So they have actually uh, contributed a lot. Uh, the idea actually kind of incubated in 2009, and it was initiated by Mr. Arun Saraf and Namita Saraf. Uh, they, are the, they are the chairman of the Saraf Foundation, and they run their hoteliers, they run the Hyatt and Yake Nitin in Kathmandu. And it was, it was a joint collaboration with Niels Wutzer, who is a German uh, historian who worked and lived in Nepal for almost 45 years. And that's how the idea was kind of incubated. It was an architecturally important building. And uh, the way they were thinking what we can actually do with this building. What, and the idea came as a museum. And, it was, and the other plan was to convert it as an architectural museum rather than any other different kind of museum. And what I mean by architectural museum is basically when, when Nepal was open to the rest of the world in the 70s, all these scholars, artists, photographers, different people travels to Nepal for different reasons. Some came as a water engineer, some were just hippies, they were travelers. But if you look back, they all kind of documented Nepal in one way or the other way. And their contribution to this country is actually very, it's humongous because many of you are from the uh, architectural students, I think, and if you, go to the library, you end up pulling an English book. You probably wouldn't pull any Nepali books. So that means most of the research work were all done by the foreigners. So our intention was to kind of bring all those materials back to Nepal and display it at the Taragma Museum. So basically it was also a way to recognize all these scholars who actually lived and worked in this country and made this country almost their home. So, क्यों कारण है गर्दा कि अब आइए तारागांव म्यूजियम में तबाई दिए दो बार देखिए मोस्ट ऑफ़ द वर्क्स आर रिलेटेड टू आर्किटेक्चर यू विल सी ड्राइंग्स पेंटिंग्स फोटोग्राफ्स स्केचेस मैप्स एंड नॉट मेनी पीपल आर एक्चुअली कीन ऑन दोस ऑब्जेक्ट्स बिकॉज़ आई थिंक इट्स अगेन कम्स अबाउट द अवेयरनेस and how important these documents are. So that's how this whole uh, museum idea was created. And in 2014, uh, we, we announced the Taragao Museum. Basically, uh, I was, until 2013, August, I was in London for a long time, and 13, I returned back. And when I returned back, I had no agenda actually to work nine to five. It was not in my uh, agenda. But uh, when I came back here, there was no place to live. And then I was engaged in building my own house. And there was nothing much to do. I didn't even have my studio. So I thought that is probably the best time for me to get engaged in my job. And, uh, and that's how I actually got connected with, uh, with uh, Taragal Museum. I actually saw the job, it actually a Meru job. And that's how I started. And when I, when I joined Taragan Museum and when I, we opened the museum in 2014, we started with roughly about 120 objects. There were drawings, photographs, maps, and a few sketches. And that's all we had. And for almost uh, two and, no, one and a half year, I was by myself. And I was running the museum, and I was trying to figure out how I'm going to make this happen, you know. And uh, it was very frustrating at some point because being in Bodha, it's not easy to access. So people were not actually willing to come to Taragam Museum, and that was one of the biggest challenges. And I used to give an example to all my friends: Look, if I invite you Hyatt for a dinner, you won't say it's far away. You will just turn up for your dinner. Why don't you come to Taragam Museum? You know, it's just within the premises. And I had to kind of work it out, how I'm going to make this happen. You know, there were so many different things were going on. 
in the first uh, year, I was kind of busy uh, setting up the basics, how I'm going to run the museum. I never worked in the museum before, and none of my uh, museum trustees or the owners, nobody had a museum. So we had no clue where we were going. And at that time, we, we didn't even have a clear vision how it's going to work out. You know? uh, it was an old building, and we had few photographs and maps. Most of the days it was quiet, nobody was coming. And I was, all, I was even frustrated at that point, you know, like, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. And then after six, seven months, then I decided, okay, maybe I'm taking it in a wrong way. I should not look back to the city. I should look back to Bodha. Because Bodha is so much multicultural, you know. All the peoples from all around the world, they're living there. So I should actually try to work with the local people and local expatriate community. And the first exhibition we did was a carpet exhibition. It was, it was rugs and Tibetan dresses and all that. And people slowly started coming to the museum. And there was local people. I'm not talking about the people from the other side of the city, but they were all locals, all local Sherpas and Tibetans and you know, local students. They were just wandering in the museums, not very keen on looking at the drawings and photographs. They were busy probably taking selfies, but that was not a problem. I, I was happy to see people coming in. And now, I, when I look back, it's, it, it has been amazing five years. You know, We have started with 150 objects, and now we have over 50,000 objects within the museum. And that is all due to these five years, what we did within the museum, and the programs we did, and the connection we made with people. Uh, one of the main important things for us was to connect with the expatriate community, and the people who actually lived in Nepal for a very long time, right? And these peoples, you know, they're so much connected with this country, and Many of us, if I show you some of the images of our temples and choipes, you probably won't be able to recognize we are in the, that situation, right? Because we never studied this in our school and colleges. And these peoples, they came for a completely different purpose. Like, for example, Kevin Berberski, he was a water engineer working for Peace Corps. And now he's one of the person who has actually documented about Nepal like nobody else has done it. So it was, I think it was all about connecting with different peoples. And that was the charm about the Taragam Museum. And when I look at the functions, the structure of the museum, this is how the structure is. We have the museum, we have the foundation, and uh, we have NAA, which is the Nepal Architecture Archive, which we announced in uh, 2016. Yes, we, we announced it in 2016. So there are three different functions happening within uh, the museum. So obviously the museum is Taragal Museum. We have got a collection. And the foundation that actually supports the museum and the Nepal Architecture Archive and the other heritage and, uh, heritage and conservation related projects. And Nepal Architecture Archive is fully dedicated <coughs> to, uh, to the collection of Nepal related documents. And it's almost like a, you know, bringing it home back, kind of, uh, it's a kind of thing, you know, like it's all gone away from Nepal and how do you actually connect it back? You know, these are not, if you, if you talk about a value wise, these are not valuable documents, but if you look at the research value, it's actually quite high. You know, these, these documents are the base of now who, whom we have become. Do you kindly go back to the Nepal Architecture Archive? Ma, ille bhano na. We, as I said, we started with 150 odd uh, objects, and we have got more than uh, 50,000 documents, and we are constantly getting donations, and we encourage people to donate because we are a foundation, and when it's required, we acquire as well. But 
these people who lived in this country for many years, they are very happy to donate their work to our foundation because many of them have been talking like, why, why are you not actually giving these documents to other organizations? For example, I've got the original drawings of Castor Mandapa drawn by uh, Wolf Jiang Ho. He was not willing to give that to the Department <coughs> of Archaeology. He was not willing to give that to the Basantapur uh, municipality. He gave that to us. And there is a reason why he gave that to us. And these people, they trust us that we will safe keep these documents for a long time. And one of our key mission is to try to make these documents accessible to the people. People, when I say people, researchers, students, and anybody who wants to research about these documents. We have been collecting the documents, but we have not been able to access, give access to the documents. You know, we have got uh, different type of materials. We have got different scholars who work in a different sectors. And the issue is these are not recorded. Like in, in museum and library and archive terminology, we call it accession or registration. We have not registered all these documents. So that means we will not be able to search. And that's a big challenge. We worked with one of the organizations recently because uh, we have no archivists. We have got no people who can actually manage this sort of documentation. And we invited a team of people from Delhi and they stayed with us for almost uh, five months and they helped us to get a chunk managed. The whole chunk hasn't been managed yet. So we have managed about 4,000, 5,000 documents and those documents I know what they are. And pe when people you know, contact me, I'll be able to say, okay, yes, I have these documents. Some of the documents I, know, I may know because people donated to me and then I'll go through it and then I may know some of them what they are. But I always feel that I'm not the right person to open the trunk they have given to me because I'll be lost. Because I didn't come from, from that background. It has to be the right people who can open these documents. Even a role as well. If it says Patan uh, Darbari Square, I will hesitate to open that document because I may just mess up the, you know, the way they have organized these documents. So as a library or an archive, you have to respect all these funds or the donors or the contributors, how they have actually donated the material to you. So what we do currently, there are so many different components under all these uh, three umbrellas. So for example, museum, I have got, I have to deal with the displays, permanent exhibitions, library, contemporary art galleries there, amphitheaters there, cafes there. You can see there's so many things are happening. And for almost a year and a half, I was kind of lost. I had all these components with me, but it was very challenging. And how would I manage it? You know, how do I deal with all these uh, objects, the components, the departments? You know, there's so much going on, and it was it was a difficult, very difficult task in the beginning. And suddenly, what I realized is the museum was helping me in a great deal because what I how I see at the moment when I look back five years behind, you know? Um, when I came back from London, I stayed there for almost 14 years. And I've been here for like uh, about five years now. And I feel, I, I honestly feel that these five years has given me that 14 years back. And the key thing is the museum. Because what I'm doing there, how, what I'm doing there and how I'm connecting with the people what sort of materials we are gathering, what sort of programs we are trying to launch there. And I think all these factors uh, have played a very important role on making the museum as well as making myself. And I think that was the, one of the best things I've actually experienced within these five years. So when you look at the display, we have many, as, as we are, as we are the architectural museum, we have these sort of materials, mainly maps, photographs, sketches, paintings, and architectural drawings. So anybody who visits the museum, 
you know, who, who don't have any interest on these objects, but they know there is a museum. They get disappointed, you know, and I, I, I get amazed, like every time I see a group of foreigners who actually visit the museum, they take hours to go through the write-ups, the pictures, the levels, the drawings, everything. They even come and talk with me. But when I see the group of Nepalese people coming there and the students coming there, they're busy taking selfies. And that's, again, one of the key reasons is basically we don't have that training about the museum in our courses and curriculum. We don't have anything in the school and we don't have anything in the college. So the awareness is less, right? And every time I see, you know, the students, especially uh, Nepali, they just walk around the museum. I saw a photo of SKSS, they just walk and pass by. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Only maybe I would have done the same when, if I was not connected with the museum because I'm also not taught right? Not in school and not in college. And we don't have a train to go to the museum. Like, we, if we have Saturdays off, you'll probably go to Chandragiri or you go to you know, uh, Nagarkot or Dhulikel, but you will not go to the museum. And I think that is another challenge. We have to create that train, how we can connect people with the museum. And that is one of the tasks I have been trying to work since the beginning of the, of the making of the Taragam Museum. And that was one of the hardest thing to deal with as well, because one of the key reason was, uh, again, the distance uh, from the city. Bauda was not everyone's cup of tea when it comes to traveling. And when, 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 you, when you look at our permanent collection, these are, these are some of the things we have. For it, it, these are basically recent materials. These are not old materials. These are all less than 100 years old, uh, you know, old. So these are, these are recent materials. But all these materials were actually preserved and created by the foreign scholars. And if you walk around the museum, you will not see any Nepalese people's work. We, we are planning to, planning to collect it, but at the moment, the majority of the work is all done by the foreign scholars, experts, artists, architects. And as I said, there's lots of photographs, I've got some watercolors, engravings, you know, architectural drawings. Some of the key important objects are um, the reproduction of Rajman Singh Chitrakar, uh, who worked for Brian Hudson in the 1850s. And then we have got some of the drawings from Oldfield around from the same time. And these are quite a, an important documents. And basically, as a museum, we safe keep these materials, we display these materials, and we try to create narratives from these materials. Because without the narratives, text, and the content, people will not be able to understand. Uh, I have a cafe within the museum, and initially I had lots of architectural drawings, you know, the plans and sections and elevations. And cafe is usually used by the local people. And they were not getting connected with the display I had in the cafe because they were just pencil drawings like blocks, sarpati kota matra images. They were not keen. They were not really keen to look at any of the images. And later on, I realized maybe I think the best thing will be uh, the drawings of Rajman Chitraka. So we have got 43 reproductions of Rajman Chitrakas that we acquired from the Madan Pustakalai, it was a collaboration between us and them. Uh, when Prince Harry visited uh, Nepal at that time, we exhibited about five of the reproductions in the British Embassy as well to show him and talk about the connection of Nepal and Britain. And these drawings, people were interested. People were interested to see the old Bautanath Stupa. They were interested to see the Chauvar. They were interested to see the sketch of custom on them, and they were interested to see the picture of Pontapur because it doesn't look the same. The city has completely changed. And they could connect. And that was one of the best kind of change I think I did within the museum space because that was the area where lots of people actually visited. And most of the maps 
and the drawings, they could not understand it. And these images, they understand. And now, when you look at the other part, other sections of the museum, uh, people are equally interested. They try to connect because we have created a different narratives. Uh, two years back, until two years back, we didn't have any Nepali text uh, in our museum, being in Nepal and being a Nepali museum. We thought it was important. So we, are, we have got a text in English and text in Nepali. So Nepali people can at least read you know, and connect with the place uh, they have grown up. So it, 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 it was a challenging process, especially to connect with the Nepali audience rather than connecting with the, with the, with the other audience. So what do I do actually in the museum? In a way, I do almost everything. You have probably seen that slide just now. So what do I mean by everything? In, in, in the context of Nepal, or in the context of a third world country, when you talk about a museum, and when you especially talk about a museum from a private sector, you end up doing everything by yourself in the beginning. And that's what I exactly did. You know? And that's a bit of a truth and a bit of an exaggeration as well. But I think I will, I still say I did everything. You know? And in a way, it was a very challenging thing. you know. And because I have a 45 years old building, it's a cluster of seven buildings, beautiful buildings built by Karl Tusha, and it has got very basic shapes, the circle, the square, and the triangle. And there are problems with the building itself, because the building is a load-bearing building. It was built you know, 45 years ago. Obviously, I have a problem with leaks. How do I cope with that? That is just one issue. I've got a big premises. How do I clean the garden? That's another issue, right? There are so many different issues. Some are connected straight away with the collection. Some are not connected with the straight away with the with the, with the, with the, with the collection. It is it is something else. It's about the maintenance. But in a way, in a in a country like ours, you end up doing everything by yourself in the beginning. Like I, I give an example of this aviation museum. When Bede Proti, he, he started this aviation museum, nobody helped him. Even the, even this, uh, you know, the, the, what is the department? The Hawaii Udian department, right? They, they could not help him. But he, he worked for it, and he has got a museum now. And still, I was, I was talking with him uh, a couple of months ago, and I told him, you must get support from the pilots and the air hostess, right? Because it's uh, you somehow connected with these people. The, the people are connected with the aircraft, and he says, "Roshanji, it's tough. Nobody even gives a single thing." So, our government they don't contribute in the private sector. They don't support the private museums, and you can you can see by looking at the the national museums, right? The, the government museums. They are yes, they are supported, but what is happening there? It's not much happening, right? They, they basically got a static collection, and they have got a flow of people, and people go and see, and that's all. They haven't designed any program. They have not actually done the hardest part of making the museum work you know, in, a, in an international context. So when I say everything, like if you look at this uh, particular chart, so this is the ideal kind of structure for my oh. museum. And if you can see it, all the red uh, words, the red letter text, they are basically, those are the people's I have, right? So you can count four people's doing actually rest of the things. And I think that's, that's exactly what happens when you open a private museum. And it's, I've just uh, been talking with uh, uh, one of the person who opened the private museum within the Sangha Fun Valley. And it's called the Karnali and South Asian Museum, I think. Karnali and South Asian Museum. And basically, he has got the photographs from the Sark countries. And he is focusing on the objects that's found in the Karnali region. And basically, these are all the cultural objects. And 
I admire him so much, you know. He had, he collected all these objects over the period of time, and he has got over 2,000 objects. And he, he talked with this water park, and they have given a space, he basically made a shade, right? And within that space, he's displaying his objects. And again, that's a static collection. So basically, people can go and see it, but, but there's no other programs attached to as museum. So basically, you have got a football, people can see it, but it's difficult when you don't actually connect with the people, right? But having said that, he has done a beautiful job. It's a good start. And I think in the context of Nepal, uh, when I look at uh, the collection we may have within our community, like especially if you look at the Newar Kandavi community, Pandes, Thapas, Thakuris, Ranas, and Shahas, they have got a huge amount of private collection. You know, if that comes out, we will probably figure out our different uh, history. We will we'll probably see our history in a completely different perspective. And I really want these people to bring this object out and create some sort of, you know, museum or a collection where people can access and research these materials. And I think that is the way we will learn our culture, we we'll connect with our tradition, and we'll learn our past. It's not only about having a static collection or having everything within a locked environment. I've just kept this picture here. I think it's, it makes sense. Recently, I've come back from, uh, from the British Museum. I stayed there for almost six weeks and uh, worked with about 24 museum professionals from different countries. And I was amazed, you know, being a British museum, I thought they probably don't have any challenges. <laughs> you know, I was amazed how much challenges they have. You know? Some of the challenges they have, I can straight away connect with my own challenges. And some of the challenges probably I'll never face it in my lifetime. You know, it's probably never will connect. In that way, I can, in, a, in a way, I can never make Tarago Museum a British museum. And it's not even that agenda either, right? But the point is how you're going to make the organization work, how you're going to make the museum work. And that's what I learned within that six, minutes, uh, six uh, weeks' time. You know, we, we, we looked at the collection management, we looked at the storage. We looked at the curatorial work, we look at the scientific research, they have labs, they have photographic labs, and all different components. They were you know, able to kind of display what the visitors needed. And you know, it's not, it was not easy. You know, as soon as we opened the door at 9 o'clock, they have over 3,000 people within the space. How do you actually manage that collection? How do you actually connect with people? And the only way I saw was creating a narrative, creating a story, talking about a journey of that particular object. If you're not able to talk about a journey of that particular object, it will never speak. And that's what they exactly did. People from all different, you know, all the people from different parts of the world, they were able to connect with these objects, some way from their own country, some way from their own hometown, and some of them from the different countries, but they were able to understand what was happening. You know, it was not about putting everything under one roof. I always call this sort of museum almost like an orphanage. You know, like they basically were with different peoples. They were discarded objects. They were found objects, and they were all gathered in one space, and they were given a beautiful home. And that's what I call it a museum especially with the archaeological museums and historical museums. And it's almost like an orphanage. And they, 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 they love these objects, you know? And the way they handle the objects, the, the way they take care of these objects is completely unimaginable. So my objects are not 3D objects. My objects are 2D objects, most of them, right? So we basically deal with the photographs, uh, they are ethnographical photographs, they are historical photographs, some of them they are portraits, right, landscapes, but they all talk about the same thing, our tradition, our culture, 
and how it can connect with us. And I, that is that is the main important thing. Like this 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 particular image, it was taken by a Czechoslovakian photographer, Poncha. And this was his own technique to create a panoramic view at that time. And he took a, took a beautiful picture of what Pasupati now. And we have probably never seen Pasupati like now in that way. You know, if you look at the river, it's we have never seen a river like that. I don't think any of the rivers in Kathmandu Valley are like that, right? And when you look at the picture itself, it's probably not, uh, you know, valuable. But when you look at, you know, research purpose, when you look at uh, in the context of Pashupati Nath, or if you look at the the civilization, our civilization that has grown around the river area and river banks, I think it's very important. And these sort of images kind of it tells our culture, it tells our history, it tells who we are. And all these images are the part of the collect, uh, current Taragao Museum collection. Like initially, these are some of the old images when you established the museum in, uh, in 2013, these were some of the initial images I had. But now what's happening is basically when, when we have a trunk given by uh, different scholars or different people. Like, for example, recently we acquired a trunk from Barbara Adams, who passed away, I think, one and a half years, two years ago. And, uh, you know, people like her who made this country their home, you know, and they have done so much in this country, and they have researched so much about this country's cultural tradition and heritage. And, these sort of documentation, they, they basically they are type of documents, but never been published, right? So what will happen with these sort of documents when someone comes to Nepal, they research about it, they type a few things, they type up their research work, they create feasibility studies, they make their research work, they probably give it to the NGOs, the NGOs, but what happens next? It's not created in a form of a book. It's just a binded, you know, book, produced probably 2030s, and it's, that's all we have. So how can we bring these sort of documents back? It's not only about these images and pictorial documents, but it's also about the written manuscripts as well. But what will happen with those documents? They will probably end up, if it's in the, with the same family, uh, it's most likely to be discarded because all these foreign scholars who lived in this country and worked hard to, you know, to research about this country, and they have collected these data, right? They have collected these drawings, the photographs, and everything. Maybe the second generation in their family is not interested on in what they have collected. So what will happen? All of these people, they probably store it in the loft or store it in the grass, and then they will probably have too much to kind of take care and they'll probably discard it. And that is the sort of materials we're trying to collect it back. Because that is the actual document which could help us to research. You know, the, the students from the engineering college or let's say the students from the arts college, they all need these documents. If you need to study about our heritage, our culture and, and and the Kathmandu Valley because most of these people initially they came to the Kathmandu Valley and that is most of the documents are actually created here. Most of the documents are from the Kathmandu Valley. Like this is one of the map. This is done by the uh, by Schneider. Really. Oh, well it's only at the two minutes right. Okay, I'll run through. So this is this is uh, this is the map. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken in 1977, and this became kind of an official map of the Kathmandu Valley, and that's how the map was developed. You know, in 1977 he created this. Still, we have got the Schneider maps. Um, I'm just gonna flip through some of the images because of the time. So these are some of the same kind of sketches from. Uh, and this is one of the main collection we have uh, from Bhumati, which is one of the very important part, uh, not far away from Kathmandu. And culturally, you know, it's very important. Architecturally, the vernacular architecture is very important. And this place, this settlement, old Newa settlement, was uh, 
was surveyed by a group of Dennis architects in, in 1968. And what they have collected at that time, uh, I keep on saying to people, you know, if somebody wants to do, uh, write a thesis or even do a PhD about Bhungmati, this trunk will be enough for them to extract the data. It's in that depth. It has got, I was amazed to see some of the drawings. They are like, you, nowadays you can see the 3D, uh, you know, models of Google drawings. They have created 3D models of this, uh, of this settlement. It was amazing. And these are some of the important documents, customer that I mentioned before. These are some of the documents we have uh, that, was, that was donated by Wolfgang Kohn. Uh, we don't have any of the oil fields uh, collection. We have got some of the reproductions, but when you talk about the museum, when you talk about architecture and culture, I think it's very important. Um, and some of these challenges I, I, I face, mm. uh, faced in the last you know, uh, five years. One is the collection, the awareness I talked about, visitor engagement, like as I said in the beginning, I have no uh, visitors now. I have visitors, but I think it's still not enough. Uh, the awareness is not there. I think it's one of the, the, the thing is we have not even uh, announced it that well. I think the museum we have not marketed that well. I believe uh, that is that is our downside. Uh, something like text levels, narratives, and research. We need the researchers. We need to research all these materials in a day-to-day -day basis. Curatorial work. Just just by hanging you know a couple of artworks, you will not be a curator. It's a whole different aspect of how you deal with the artwork, how you take care of it. I, I, I would probably call myself a take care of the objects rather than calling a curator. I think in the 21st century, the work is very trendy at the moment. Uh, educational program, uh, we have recently started. We're trying to work with school and colleges. Uh, collection managers, management, I mentioned you. Uh, we worked with the Indian uh, archiving agency. Uh, they are again coming back, and we are trying to work with them again. Maintenance, that's a different issue. Fund, we don't have any government funds. We, we rely on the funds that's uh, injected by our foundation, the Sara Foundation. And staffing as well. I think it's one of the uh, key things, because not many of the artists probably they want to work in the museum, because if they sell one art artwork, that, that probably will be equivalent to the salary what we offer. So I'm trying to find the people who are actually working in sidelines, like a photographer or something who wants to write about art. And they're likely to stay in the museum for a long time, and they will be able to support the museum. Because people coming from the, uh, the direct background, like the architectural field or the art field, it, it's not helping. That's what I've realized uh, in the past. Um, some of the programs that's happening at the moment, Targo Museum Contemporary Art Gallery, this was initially announced in 2015, but later I re redesigned it and announced it in 2018 May. Uh, we, we're promoting our space for young and upcoming artists. Open Studio has been started, performance art happens there very frequently, and I let the local people use that space as well. Like some of the local organizations, you know, they're working with very less fund and they have no fund sometimes. And my spaces are open space, you know, and it doesn't hurt me to let them use that space. So I let them use the space constantly. If they have any programs, I always encourage them to come and work within that space. Um, this is the contemporary art gallery we have through that uh, gallery. We do different programs. Uh, the performance art happens there, uh, different events happens. Uh, we did the Kathmandu Trinale, we were one of the venue there at that time. And this is one of our main program, uh, which we call it uh, Taragao Lecture Series. This we have been able to do it since the establishment of the, of the museum. And this, this, is, this has been the best method to kind of connect with the scholars and the and the, and the expatriate community who have actually worked in Nepal for a very long time. So we basically invite one of the scholars from abroad, we let them come to the museum, uh, they do a lecture, we, we exhibit their work, and if they have a book, then we launch that book as well, and we support the publication as well. So the, 
the whole program is supported by us. So these are some of the other activities that happens, the, you know, that makes the Taragao Museum happening in a way. And one way or the other way, the cafe and the farmer's market that we have, uh, they actually uh, support on kind of marketing the museum uh, to the local people. So these are some of the programs I've been trying to work with. Some of the large events, musical programs, Targum Lecture Series, I, 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 I mentioned you. Uh, some of the points I want to, uh, some of the programs I actually want to talk about, like Children's Art Award, this is something we are announcing now. And I think that is the best way to connect with the students. So basically we're gonna create a venue in Targum Museum, invite schools, we'll do an exhibition, we'll, 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 we'll announce the winner, and we want schools engagement within the within the museum space and the other other <coughs> uh, program we're doing is school tours and visit and the tactile boxes like basically like i've got lots of uh, temples and display and basically these students they would not know what sort of bricks has been used or if it's whether it's a you know, flamed bricks or it's adobe bricks. So we, we, we're, we're creating a box where people can touch these objects, the bricks, the adobe bricks, the chuna, the surgi, you know, all these materials. And they'll have a fairly good idea how the temple are created and what sort of materials have been used. So these are all the different programs uh, we're trying to organize. One of the program which we have recently uh, announced is the Object in Focus. This is one of the program I actually got inspired by the British Museum. And it's focused towards the contemporary art. And uh, basically, we in a, in a fall like this, we're just exhibiting one object. And we just want to see how people react when just seeing one object in the exhibition hall. You know? When you see 20 objects, you'll have a different way, different way of thinking about these objects. But what will happen if you look at one object for 15 minutes? You know, and that's how I want to create a dialogue about the contemporary art and how people understand how what sort of understanding they will have within the contemporary art field. Uh, this is some of the educational program that has happened within the museum. Uh, this is the musical event. I I work with uh, the uh, the college students and give them a tour as well. So talk about the restoration, conservation, and preservation how the Taragong Museum was brought back into this standard because in 2009, it was almost like a dead space. It was, these brick, bricks were not red as these, these were, the, those were probably black and green. You know, it took almost five years to bring it back to that, uh, that condition. Uh, other programs, we do talk programs. Uh, we talk about different uh, projects that we are doing within the, within the museum or that's happening within the foundation. So that's, that's, uh, that's Taragong Museum. I'll go to the Nepal Architecture Archive, which is part of the, uh, part of the Sara Foundation, which, which is basically the main body that collects all the documents that we receive from different donors and different people. And this space is basically, we're trying our best to make it accessible to the people because it's not only about collecting these objects, but it's also about giving access to the people as well. Because we have got all the heritage and culture related objects, and if we don't get access, if the students don't get access, it doesn't mean anything. So that's one of the reasons we invited these archivists to kind of manage our collection, and they will be able to, uh, they will be able to make it accessible, and we'll, which we are planning our best to make it accessible by the end of 2000. 19 this year. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the uh, traditional objects, architectural objects we have created, uh, collected. Uh, some of the wooden carvings, the bricks from different sites, uh, pots from Bhaktapur. These are also the part of the archive collection. And this sort of collection, we are the first one who has been collecting this sort of material. <coughs> None of the other archives or the library or the museums are collecting these sort of objects. Um, I'm gonna go back to the other museum, which basically we're creating a museum in 3,775 meters high, precisely. Our, 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 our
<laughs> Shall I just quickly show you some of the images? Um, so this is uh, this is on 3,000, uh, almost 4,000 meters high. This museum we are building, but we don't have any objects. We are working with curators and designers who can create the objects, and that is due to be uh, launched in 2019 September. If we can put the roof up, the roof is not there yet, and. Uh, this design was done by the Sustainable Mountain Architects, SMA. So I'll just flick through some of the slides. Um, this is one of the museum I'll be trying to uh, create about my own dad's work. Uh, basically, I've got all the objects. Nobody else in this world can open the Manoj Babu Mr. Museum. I'm the only one who can probably open it, but I'm working towards it to make it happen. So I've got the objects, but I don't have the museum. Uh, these are some of the images I have. And this is another museum, online platform I've created, Global Nepali Museum. So basically this is an online platform. I call it a virtual museum. It's also a database of Nepali objects that has gone out of Nepal. So this is going to be a precise kind of inventory that will be online. It's actually online at the moment, so which is which is on a trial phase. So basically, this one there is a museum, but I don't own any of the objects. So I've been working with lots of museums, and they are willing to give an access. Like for example, British Museum has already given me access to their uh, digital collection, and that will go on the website. And yeah, that's that's all. So if you have any questions, uh, throw it to me. Sorry, I went. I could not go through all the slides I have. We crossed the time. Uh, but let me let me know if you have any questions or if you have any queries about what I'm doing there, what Tarragon Museum can do, or how even you can help. If you have any ideas, you can always share with me, and we can we can try to make it happen.